The Texas Parks and Wildlife television series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Any rare animal is difficult to study, especially species that are nocturnal and not easy to find. He's back up. I thought it was too good to be true. You get to live at a beautiful place, be a part of something bigger than yourself. I think one of the things that President Johnson wanted the public to see here was how life was like when he grew up. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. We're about uh, three or four miles from Oklahoma in Wichita County, Texas. Look at this one over here, Silas. Well, it doesn't come out vertically. You want to set a trap? Yeah. A trap and a camera. I'm a graduate student at Texas State University in the Wildlife Ecology Program. And we are surveying for Texas kangaroo rats. They hop on their back legs like a kangaroo, hence the name. It looks a lot like your pet store gerbil, about again and a half as big, with a white tail tip. It is a state threatened species. So it does seem to be pretty rare geographically. It's only been found in 11 counties in Texas, and within the past 20 years, only found in five of those 11 counties. They're about the handsomest rodent that you can find. If we lose it here, it is done as a species. It would be an easy species to pay a little bit of attention to and keep on the map. Got anything over there? There's two or three. Today we're surveying to see if kangaroo rats are using the same burrows and areas as they were this summer. There's quite a bit of burrows over here. Fresh kick out. Let's us know that it's active and not abandoned. We're setting motion sensitive cameras that will record video um, in infrared. And we're also setting spring loaded box traps. I'm gonna bait the area. Are we seeing just the last vestiges of populations that are hanging on? We don't know. Uh, I think that's the reason uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service want to find that out. Right at the next intersection, there should be a burrow. Well, we are assisting Texas State University on Texas kangaroo rat research. And uh, in addition, we're actually funding them through our state wildlife grant program. It's a species that's not federally endangered yet, but it's a species of concern for us. It's, it's obviously declining. We don't have a lot of great information on this species, so we're trying to learn as much as we can. But it's a species that we're concerned about, and it's been a concern for a while. I haven't seen one yet. I've seen some other species of kangaroo rat, but not the Texas kangaroo rat, so I'm hoping to. More times than not, we'll get them on the camera and not in the traps. They're rather trap shy. Right, we're giving up. Fingers crossed for some rat activity. Any rare animal is difficult to study, especially species like this that are they're nocturnal and they're elusive and they're not easy to find. Roadside surveys have been kind of a survey method of choice. 1,500 survey miles total, so that's driving around at night uh, between 10 p.m. and about 5 a.m. The success is always low. You've got to cover a lot of miles to find a very few individuals. 
it gets a little bit tedious, and some nights we went without seeing a single one. Went home a little upset. He's back out. He's like groundhogging us. Up, up, down. Been dark about an uh, hour and a half, two hours, and I already got some activity. Cotton rat. Well, we only saw one. Uh, two kangaroo rats. <laughs> Pretty quick. Weeze a few hairs off to get a DNA sample. Sorry, buddy. Then we're gonna weigh him 93 grams. And then we're gonna get some standard length measurements on them. 42 millimeters for hind foot, ears, eight, and tail. Right at 210. Oh, the tail. All right. We would like to find enough of these animals to say that, okay, here's a species that may have been in decline. If we learn enough about it, we can, instead of putting it on the endangered species list, implement some management strategies. It's one of our prime objectives at Texas Parks and Wildlife. Hey, 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 hey. Keep things off the endangered species list. 80 grams, the bag's 10 grams. Oh, yeah. oh another uh, Texas kangaroo rat. Nice. If they exist in these roadside habitats, they may be evolutionarily adapted to fire and bison herds, those disturbed environments that would occur after those events. They hop, adapted to wide open spaces, bare ground created by some agricultural practices, by grazing, may be very suitable for these animals. Short grass, well grazed, lots of areas between grass so they can move around freely edges of farm fields where you have the little bit of bare ground next to the fence and that seems to be their ticket. They are unique. It's part of this ecosystem that's been here for a long, long time. Why not care for it? They don't have any detrimental effect to the landowners. They don't invade houses, don't dig large holes, they don't disrupt farming practices, so they can exist here very easily. There's more interest in non-game species than there has been in the past. We really need to have more natural history information on the whole gamut of wildlife. We know really very little. This is great information. 181. We're learning more about the habitat needs of the species, its biology, its life history. And it's very valuable as we try to develop recommendations for private landowners. So this guy is ready for release. Any key to the future of this species is going to be through private land. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. I like my brain to be busy. I mean, that's when I'm happiest. When my brain's busy, I'm trying to solve something. My first two years of school, I got all my nursing prereqs. And then right before I applied to nursing school, I just like, nah. <laughs> Studying wildlife biology at West Texas A&M University. I don't have any student loans so far, and I would have to take out student loans for an apartment. I was looking at the rent around uh, Canyon, and I mean, that was real expensive. I researched about the volunteer opportunities, and I just came across being a park host. And in the description, it says you can keep your camper up there. You get a camp spot for while you're working. 
And so I was like, hmm, that's interesting. I looked up the distance between here and my school, and it wasn't bad, it was like 10 minutes. Everybody was like, thought I was crazy. I'm like, what do you mean you're gonna go live in a camper? Cheetos doubling as cheese. Don't judge me, amount of cheese slices. <laughs> I mean, I was really fortunate that my grandparents let me use their camper. Since it's just me and my dog and my snake, it's really all the space we need. It's a great way to go through college. Lindsay is a little different. She's at a totally different end of the spectrum than what we typically see in our Park Host program. We have some regular folks that volunteer with us. Park Hosts are staffed in each one of our camping loops. Hackberry to headquarters with a site count. Go ahead. You can't have or expect park staff to be on site 24 hours a day in a camping loop. But with Park Host, they can be there. Morning, folks. How are you? You know, you have required site counts. Come up and register. Are you leaving today? No, we'll be here one more night. And then you're responsible for keeping the bathroom stocked and clean. Okay, dear, it's all clear. They're shorthanded. There's no way to fill that gap other than with volunteer services. And sir, what's your name? My name's Kent. Kent, I'm Eric. Eric, we are the well, best and the first and the most well, available point of contact for campers. Through that intersection then you'll see another little intersection right there. There's a lot of stuff that, that we could not do as successfully without our volunteers. Most of them, I would say, are uh, retirees, and they do everything from keeping their restroom and their loop clean to helping at the gatehouse to helping with interpretive programs. And if they have special skills, then we make extra. use of that too. They need more projects to do anyway. You know, we didn't start <laughs> out intending it to be like an internship, but yeah, the experiences that she's gaining is very much like one. She's just starting her working life. So she just has a little different perspective on things. The primary use for that property is Lindsay is not jaded by some of the boundaries of life, you know, that some people know because of their experiences. She knows no bounds at this point. That's contagious. So it's been wonderful for my staff for her to just be here. It's a job that you don't hate. <laughs> You're not like, ah, oh, I gotta go to work, you know? I will work out in the field if they need me there. If they don't really need me anywhere at the moment, I just kind of figure out something that needs to be done with the park, like either a pickup trash or help clean out one of the camp loops, clean bathrooms, stuff like that. I mean, I prefer this over working somewhere else. So I lived in an apartment before this, in a house, in an apartment, never lived in a camper. <laughs> It is a little challenging balancing everything. Sometimes you get sightseers in the park and if I was running late to class or something, then <laughs> I might be a little extra late after that. As I've gone along through the semester, I've been balancing it better. Good time management skills, yeah. Remember with waterfowl, we had how many flyways? I would really like to be a wildlife biologist. I mean, I've learned a lot from just living out here. And it's relaxing in some ways, and it's exciting at the same time. I thought, you know, it was too good to be true. You get to live at a beautiful place, be a part of something bigger than yourself. You feel right at home. Statistics show that more than half of the fatal firearm incidents reported each year occur in the home. Since almost all incidents are caused by carelessness and lack of knowledge, it's the hunter's responsibility to help prevent firearm mishaps in the home. This loaded pistol is a tragedy waiting to happen. 
and what's more, it's illegal. It is unlawful to store, transport, or abandon an unsecured loaded firearm in a place where children can obtain unsupervised access to the firearm. Look at the way these firearms and ammunition are being stored. Is this safe? No, firearms should not be stored alongside ammunition in an unsecured location. A locking gun cabinet or safe is a much better solution. On the right side, unloaded rifles and shotguns are stored. Many people store them with the barrels up. Over time, oils can drip down and clog your actions. It's much better to store with the barrels pointed down. On the other side, ammunition is stored separately, also under locked conditions. Remember, it's your responsibility to keep your firearms safe and secure. basic, no running water, no electricity. Sauer Beckman depicts life as a working farm in 1915. <laughs> we don't recreate, we just continue the traditions and the, and the lifestyle of that period of time. Oh, the cat's going to try to move in. He's thinking about it. It was one of the ideas of LBJ to actually have this happen, the concept of people realizing what life was like without electricity and running water. And he said, people aren't going to know that if we don't somehow preserve that. These folks didn't have electricity, so we can't have an electric motor on our mill. We're going to try to be pure to our farm down here. We can't cheat our grandparents, can we? You know, these people, they ate a lot of lard, they ate a lot of fat, but they were working so hard that it really didn't make them fat because they burned it all off, didn't they? They worked their way through all those calories. Is that easy work there, bud? No. No? <laughs> That's probably one of the big things that now is really coming around, especially the last couple of years, just what life was, what are those basics of what do you need to live? Do you need all the stuff? I had a little boy, he, was, he came with his grandmother, and he was whispering something to her, and so she goes, well, ask her. And finally he did, he goes, well, he goes, do you have a TV? And I said, a TV? I said, what's that? And he said, well, it... It has, it has cartoons on it, and he goes, and it has a remote. That's life. <laughs> you know? Keep away from the gals and those good fellow pals. As long as you've got money, they'll be through. Treat everyone fair, always be on the square. And everybody everywhere will welcome you. Settle down for life with a good little wife. Remember that today you'll always most of the day was spent just cooking meals or working on a meal for another day. Now look here. I'll show you what's making this stove work. Oh. Is that hot? <laughs> and who do you think's job might be to keep that wood box built? <laughs> That'd be yours. Your job, yeah. Well, the important rule on the farm here was if you don't work, you don't eat. Chicken, chicken, chicken. It's amazing the, the reaction that, that people, when they watch us feed the pigs or feed the chickens, when they watch us milk the cow, they're awed that they've never seen that happen. The closest they've ever come to most of this stuff is in their supermarket when they get a carton of eggs or a box of butter, and this opens their eyes to where it really comes from. Those folks, will you gain a big appreciation for the work that the 
the people that settled this area, how they had to just to survive in this environment. You have a great little pair of mules for this up here. Good girl. When you ask them to trot, just pop them gently with the rain. You with me? Mm -hmm. The first thing I would do is I would teach the mule to go forward. Step in there. Walk into the shoulder, step, shift, come right back around. Then you step into him, step right in behind the shoulder and look at him. Got it? Looks easy, doesn't it? Now what you need to do is to practice it. Cluck to him, cluck, cluck. He's not paying attention to you. <laughs> Let me try this again. Step behind the shoulder. Now, no, that's good. Turn, quit clucking. It's easy when he does it. <laughs> I think one of the things that President Johnson wanted the public to see here was how life was like when he grew up and what made him do many of the legislative acts that he did. The founding fathers dreamed America before it was. The pioneers dreamed of great cities on the wilderness that they had crossed. For it will be the dream that we dare to dream. You really can see why he felt the public would gain the sense of compassion for history and how it can shape a person and how you can make a big difference in life if you really choose to. You don't have to start out being wealthy or anyone in particular. You can mold your life to be whatever you want and he happened to grow up to be a president. and has made a big impact on America and Texas and this community of the Texas Hill Country. We seek a nation where every man can seek knowledge Hi. and touch beauty and rejoice in the closeness of family and community. go to the Sour Beckman farm and you take electricity and running water out of your lifestyle and see how people survived and then how creative and inventive they are and then all our benefits that we have today that came from all of that. It just awes me when I think back at how far we've come as a society but how important it is to thank our grandparents and all those aunts and uncles and people that brought us to where we are today in life. Wish you could spend more time with nature? Well, every month you can have the great outdoors delivered to you. Since 1942, Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine has been the outdoor magazine of Texas. Every issue is packed with outstanding photography and writing about the wild things and wild places of this great state. And now, Texas's best outdoor magazine is available as an app. It's just that easy. Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine, your connection to the great outdoors.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.